One day. Somebody's gonna have to make a stand. One day. Somebody's gonna have to say enough. The espionage as such occupies only 10 to 15 percent of money, time, and manpower. 15 percent. The rest 85 percent is always subversion. And unlike a dictionary of English, Oxford Dictionary, Subversion in Soviet terminology means always a destructive, aggressive activity aimed to destroy the country, nation, or geographical area of your enemy. So there's no romantics in there, absolutely. No blowing up bridges, no microfilms in Coca-Cola cans, nothing of that sort. No James Bond nonsense. It's most of the, this activity is overt, legitimate, and easily observable if you give yourself time and trouble to observe it. But according to the law and, and law enforcement systems of the Western civilization, it's not a crime. Exactly because of misconception, manipulation of terms. We think that subverter is a person who is going to blow up our beautiful bridges. No. Subverter is a student who comes for exchange, a diplomat an actor, an artist, a journalist. If you wish to destroy an area, how do you do it? Well, there are two ways. You can go in there and bomb it and so forth, but that is not very efficient. What you do is you try to get the people in that area killed each other and to destroy their own territory, their own farms. And that's what's been done in that area. The way in which you destroy and bomb is get him to destroy himself by dividing his ranks against one another. And then you feed both sides. You have agents feeding both sides, inflating both sides. And they kill each other off. And it's time that some of us woke up to this reality to understand that the people who try to maintain empires and create empires do it by manipulating the people they're trying to conquer. That system is our enemy. When you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. 
And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. The first human being who formulated the tactics of subversion was a Chinese philosopher by the name of Sun Tzu. To 2,500 years BC, he was an advisor for several imperial courts in, in ancient China, and he said, after long meditation, that. To implement, foreign, uh, to implement state policy in a warlike manner, it's the most counterproductive, barbaric, and inefficient to fight on a battlefield. You know that war is continuation of state policy, right? So if you want successfully to implement your state policy, and you start fighting, this is the most idiotic way to do it. The highest art of warfare is not to fight at all, but to subvert anything of value in the country of your enemy until such time that the perception of reality of your enemy is screwed up to such an extent that he does not perceive you as an enemy and that your system, your civilization and your ambitions look to your enemy as an alternative if not desirable, then at least feasible. Better red than dead. That's the ultimate purpose, the final stage of subversion, after which you can simply take your enemy without a single shot being fired, if the subversion is successful. This is basically what subversion is. It consists of four periods, time-wise. If we start from here and go this way, time, right? This is the beginning point. The first stage of subversion is the process which is called, basically, demoralization. It says for itself what it is. It takes from, uh, say, 15 to 20 years to demoralize a society. Why? by 15 or 20 years. This is the time sufficient to educate one generation of students or children. One generation. One lifetime span of a person, a human being, which is dedicated to study, to shaping up the outlook, ideology, personality. No more, no less. Usually it takes from 15 to 20 years. What it includes? It includes influencing or by various methods, infiltration, uh, propaganda methods, direct contacts, doesn't really matter. I will describe them later. <laughs> of various areas where public opinion is formulated or shaped. So. On the stage of demoralization, obviously, there are tendencies in each society, in each country, which are going to opposite direction from the basic moral values and principles. To take advantage of these movements, to capitalize on them, is the main purpose of the originator of subversion. So we have religion, we have education, we have uh, social life, we have power structure, we have labor relations, uh, unions, and finally we have law and order. Oh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? These are the areas of application of subversion. Αναλαμβάνετε κύριε Πρόεδρε την Προεδρία της Ελληνικής Δημοκρατίας για μία πενταετία όπου θα σημειωθούν σημαντικά γεγονότα και εξελίξεις. Η Ευρωπαϊκή Ενωπήση θα προωθηθεί με την ψήφιση ενδεχομένως και της συνταγματικής συνθήκης. Τα εθνικά σύνορα και ένα μέρος της εθνικής κυριαρχίας 
θα περιοριστούν χάρη τη ειρήνη και τη ευημερία και τη ασφάλεια στη διευρυμένη Ευρώπη. Τα δικαιώματα του ανθρώπου και του πολίτη θα υποστούν μεταβολέ, καθώ θα μπορούν να προστατεύονται, αλλά ίσω και να παραβιάζονται από αρχέ και εξουσίε πέραν των γνωστών και καθιερωμένων. Και πάντως η δημοκρατία θα συνεντήσει προκλήσεις και θα δοκιμαστεί από ενδεχόμενες νέες μορφές διακυβέρνησης. Αν εγώ που έχω το κεφάλαιο αγοράσω τον αρχηγό, έχω αγοράσει το κόμμα όλο. Ναι ή όχι. Ναι. Είναι τέσσερα κόμματα, τρία κόμματα, τέσσερα σε ένα κράτο. Αγοράζω τέσσερα αρχηγού. Έχω όλο το κράτο στα χέρια μου. Γιατί ο αρχηγό θα ορίσει υποψηφίου. Ποιου, αυτού που έχω εγώ και συνεργάτε και τα λεφτά. μου οργανώσει. Και έτσι φτάσαμε σε αυτή την κατάσταση στην οποία βρισκόμαστε σήμερα, κύριε. Έχουμε κοινοβολευτική δικτατορία, κύριε. Το πολιτισμό μα δεν είναι δημοκρατία, σα κοροϊδεύουν. Είναι δικτατορία κοινοβολευτική και είναι η χειρότερη δημοκρατία που αναπτύχθηκε στην ανθρωπότητα μέχρι σήμερα. Διότι κύριε, το κατεστημένο ξέρει να δουλεύει τον κόσμο και ξέρει τον το ελληνικό λόγο να τον δουλέψει. Έβαλε δύο ανθρώπου δικού του. Την τώρα και τον Σαμαρά. Ψήφισε όποιον θέλει. Η λύση έγινε. Τι κόσμο θα είναι, όποιον θέλει να βγάλει. Δηλαδή, αν δεν ψήφισε τον Σαμαρά, ποιο θα βγει, ή τώρα. Γιατί δεν είναι του καταστημένου ή τώρα. Δεν είναι στην Πίλτεμπερκ και τώρα. Ήταν ο κύριος Αβραμόπουλος. Δεν είναι στην Πίλτεμπερκ και τώρα. Ο Αβραμόπουλος πήρε η αντολή, τράφηξε τα θήκη και το παρατήσει, ο παρετήθη. Κύριε, στα παρασκήνια βγαίνει ο αρχηγός, τον αρχηγό τον ορίζει το καταστημένο. Τον αρχηγό κάθε κόμματο καταλάβει το οι Έλληνε αν θέλετε να σου δούμε. Τον ορίζει ο Ρόθσιλντ. Πηγαίνουν τους υποψηφίου. Τα προσόντα και τα ελαττώματα Καλά, του και καθενός αυτός ο άνθρωπος και αυτός δηλαδή. λέει αυτόν θα βάλετε, ε, αυτόν βάζουνε το κόμμα αρχηγό. Συμφωνούμε με την κυβέρνηση μόνο σε ένα σημείο, ότι η απόφαση, η επιλογή της ένταξης της Ελλάδας στην κοινή αγορά είναι η πιο κρίσιμη απόφαση που έχει πάρθει για το έθνο, η οποία πάθηκε στον βωμό του ανήκομεν ή στην Δύση. Δεν τα παλαβάτε αυτό, με συγχωρείτε. Με συγχωρείτε, δεν τα παλαβάτε, το αρχίζετε με αυτό. Η Ελλάδα ανοίξε την υπόβαση. Θέλετε από παράδοση, θέλετε από συμφέροντα, ανοίξτε την υπόβαση. Όταν λοιπόν παλαβάζετε από αυτό, ανήκομαι στην Δύση. Και δεν το ανήκομαι στην Δύση. Όπω άλλοι λαοί ανήκουν στου αντασμένου, ανήκουν στου ανατολικού, ανήκουν στου Αφρικανού. Που την έννοια αυτή να ανήκω με στενή. Προτιμούμε να ανήκω με στου Έλληνε. Πριν λίγο καιρό μιλούσε για πολλέ Ελλάδε. Σήμερα βρίσκεται αντιμέτωπο με τα πολλά Πασόκ. Ο κατήφορο του Πρωθυπουργού τη Διαπλοκή δεν έχει τέλο. Τα επιτεύγματα τη οικονομία μα δεν μπορούν να αμφισβητηθούν. Γιατί στι Σοφοκλέου 
διαπράχθηκε ένα από τα μεγαλύτερα εγκλήματα της ομάδας που κυβερνά. Αυτή είναι η αλήθεια. Οι Έλληνες και οι Ελληνίδες δεν έχουν τίποτα, μα τίποτα πια να περιμένουν από την κυβέρνηση της Νέας Δημοκρατίας. Δεν πρόκειται να συμβιβαστώ με την αντιδραστικότητα λίγων βολεμένων. C'est qui vient d'avoir des élections en Grèce et que la gauche au pouvoir a gagné. Ça aurait été la droite, c'était pareil. Ce qui m'intéresse, ce n'est pas que la gauche ait gagné, c'est que le gouvernement en place, avec le programme du FMI, a été compris par l'opinion, et que l'opinion est derrière le gouvernement. C'est jamais arrivé dans le passé. C'est jamais arrivé dans le passé que, avec un programme aussi dur que celui que les Grecs sont amenés à supporter, parce que la situation est très difficile, on arrive à faire comprendre à la population que c'était nécessaire. See, my mind doesn't work that way. I got this real moron thing I do, it's called thinking. And I'm not a really good American because I like to form my own opinions. I don't just roll over when I'm told to. Sad to say, most Americans just roll over on command. Not me. Not me. I have certain rules I live by. My first rule, I don't believe anything the government tells me. Nothing. And, and I don't take very seriously the media or the press in this country who most of the time function as kind of an unofficial public relations agency for the United States government. <laughs> Hello. My name is Montague William III. And what I will tell you may well sound absurd, but the less who believe it, the better for me. For you see, I'm in banking and a big industry. For many a year we have controlled your lives, while you all just struggle and suffer in strife. We created the things that you don't really need, your, your sports cars and fashions and plasma TVs. I remember it clearly how all this began. Family secrets from father to son. Inherited knowledge that gives me the edge while you pe people lie sleeping at night in your beds. We control the money that controls your lives. Whilst you worship false idols and wouldn't think twice about selling your souls for a place in the sun, these things that won't matter when your time is done. But as long as they're there to control the masses, I just sit back and consider my assets, safe in the knowledge that I have it all, while you common people are losing your jobs. You see, I just hold you in utter contempt. But the smile on my face, well, it makes me exempt. For I have the weapon of global TV, which gives us connection and invites empathy. You would really believe that we look out for you, while we bankers and brokers are only a few. But if you saw that, you'd take back the power. Hence, daily terrors to make you all cower. The panics, the crashes, the wars, and the illness that keep you from finding your spiritual wholeness. We rig the game, and we buy out both sides to keep you enslaved in your pitiful lives. So, go out and work as your body clock fades. And when it's all over, a few years from the grave, you'll look back on all this, and just then, you'll see that your life was nothing, a mere fantasy. 
There are very few things that we don't now control. To have lawyers and police force was always a goal, doing our bidding while you march on the street. But they never realize that they're only just sheep. For real power resides in the hands of a few. <laughs> you voted for parties. <laughs> what more could you do? But what you don't know is they're one and the same. Old Gordon has passed good old David the reins, and you'll follow the leader who was put there by you. But your blood, it runs red, while our blood runs blue. But you simply don't see it's all part of the game. Another distraction, like money and fame. Get ready for wars in the name of the free. Vaccinations for illness that will never be. The assault on your children's impressionable minds. And a microchipped world. You'll put up no fight. Information suppression will keep you in tow. Depopulation of peasants was always our goal. But eugenics was not what we hoped it would be. Oh yes, it was us that funded Nazis. But as long as we own all the media too, what's really happening does not concern you. So just go on watching your plasma TV and the world will be run by the ones you can't see. The choice lies with you. You can continue to be a slave to the financial system and watch the continuous wars, depressions, and injustice across the globe while placating yourself with vain entertainment and materialistic garbage. Or you can focus your energy on true, meaningful, lasting, holistic change, which actually has the realistic ability to support and free all humans with no one left behind. But in the end, the most relevant change must occur first inside of you. The real revolution is the revolution of consciousness. And each one of us first needs to eliminate the divisionary materialistic noise we have been conditioned to think is true, while discovering, amplifying, and aligning with the signal coming from our true empirical oneness. It is up to you. In the book 1984, George Orwell warned that people were in danger of losing their human qualities and freedom of mind without being aware of it while it was happening because of psychological, emotional, and intellectual manipulation mind control. The most effective way to protect yourself from subconscious manipulation is by being aware of how it works. What the conscious mind believes, the subconscious acts on. It works like programming a computer. Information is fed into a computer and the computer acts on it. However, if the information fed into the computer is wrong, it still acts on it. If a person believes something that is not true, the memory banks of the subconscious mind do not correct the error, but act on it. People can be led to believe something that is not true when that information is carefully timed and presented by an accepted and respected authority. The purpose of propaganda is to direct public attention to certain facts. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball.
The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half miss the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. Να θυμόμαστε πάντα πως αυτοί που φωνασκούν περισσότερο για χάρη της ελευθερίας είναι άπλιστοι για κυριαρχία και δεσποτισμό. Υπερπληθωρισμό, υπερανεργία και ξανά χρεοκοπία. Αλλά σήμερα είμαστε ένα από τα πιο, αν όχι το πιο συγκεντρωτικό κράτος της Ευρωπαϊκής Ένωσης. Γιατί πίστευα, και το πιστεύω ακόμα, πως ήρθε απ' έξω με την υπερηφάνεια του παντογνώστη και ανέλαβε την εξουσία. Θέλει να φτιάξει ένα σπίτι χωρίς να ξέρει τις ανάγκες αυτών που θα το κατοικούσε. Μα είπε έτσι ζουν στην Ευρώπη, έτσι πρέπει να ζήσετε κι εσείς. Όμως ο πιο καθοριστικός παράγοντας είναι η αστάθεια και η αβεβαιότητα για τις προοπτικές της ελληνικής οικονομίας. Είναι ο φόβος της χρεοκοπίας και της εξόδου από το ευρώ που σκιάζει τους αποταμιευτές, αναστέλει τις επενδυτικές αποφάσεις, παγώνει την οικονομική δραστηριότητα, εμποδίζει την ανάκαμψη της οικονομίας. Κάθε έννοια δικαιοσύνης, κάθε έννοια ανθρωπισμού, κάθε έννοια ελευθερίας, κάθε έννοια λογικής κατελήθη προκειμένου να εξυπηρετηθούν ξένα προς τα έθνος συμφέροντα. Μια άτακτη χρεοκοπία θα έριχνε τη χώρα μας σε μια καταστροφική περιπέτεια. Θα δημιουργούσε συνθήκες ανεξέλεγκτου οικονομικού χάους και κοινωνικής έκρηξης. Οι αποταμιεύσεις των πολιτών θα κινδύνευαν. Το κράτος θα δυνατούσε να πληρώσει μισθούς, συντάξεις, να καλύψει στοιχειώδεις λειτουργίες όπως τα νοσοκομεία και τα σχολεία. Η εισαγωγή βασικών αγαθών όπως φάρμακα, πετρέλαιο και μηχανήματα θα γινόταν προβληματική. Επιχειρήσεις θα έκλειναν μαζικά, αδυνατώντας να αντλήσουν χρηματοδότηση. Η ανεργία, η οποία είναι ήδη απαράδεκτα υψηλή, θα αυξανόταν περισσότερο. Το βιωτικό επίπεδο των Ελλήνων, στην περίπτωση μιας άτακτης χρεοκοπίας, θα κατέρε. Η χώρα θα παρασυρώταν σε μια μακρά δίνη ύφεσης, αστάθειας, ανεργίας και παρατεταμένης εξαθλίωσης. Από χώρα του πυρήνα της Ευρωζώνης, η Ελλάδα θα καταντούσε χώρα αδύναμη στο περιθώριο της Ευρώπης. Με την οικονομική και κοινωνική καταστροφή που θα ακολουθούσε εάν δεν το διοθετούσαμε. Όλοι φοβούνται. Και οι μεν και οι δε. Και οι πάνω και οι κάτω. Το στίχημα είναι πάντα το ποιο θα ελέγξει το φόβο και θα τον διαχειριστεί προ όφελό του. Και πώ θα καταφέρει να μετατρέψει ένα εργαλείο χειρισμού συνειδήσεων σε μηχανισμό προστασία. The functions of the body to survive can be broken down to two basic functions for any organism to survive. You have to be able to grow, maintain yourself, take care of your biology. But you also must be able to protect yourself, so that if you're just growing and you can't protect yourself, you'll become food for something else. So the uh, survival involves a balance between growth and protection. Through the history of human civilization and through a human evolution, we recognize that our nature is to be in a state of growth, and that our protection is only supposed to be used to, you know, help us out of that that threatening moment. You can't be in growth and in protection at the same time. So the significance is, when we see a need of protection, the stress hormones in the body shut off the blood vessels in our viscera, our gut, which is the part of the body for growth. Well, the issue is, if you took the blood from the viscera and moved it out to the arms, then you left no blood in the viscera. That means no growth. But you're ready to fight. And when your fighting is finished, then the blood returns back to the viscera and you grow again. But in the world that we live in today, 
It's 24-7 fear. So we have a continuous dripping of that stress hormone into the body. It's just dripping all the time, getting us ready to run or fight or flight at any moment at the drop of a hat. We're ready to go because we're on guard. Well, the problem is, what does that mean about your allocation of energy? And it says, we're spending most of our energy in protection. You cannot survive if you're in protection all the time. Και θα ήταν η μεγαλύτερη ήττα τη μεταπολευτική Ελλάδα αν από λιποψυχία ή ελλειπή αίσθηση ευθύνη, από βαριά αμέλεια ή από μοιραίο λάθο, αυτή η χώρα κατέληγε κάποια στιγμή χρεοκοπημένη και έξω από το ευρώ. Είστε υποκριτέ. Γιατί λέτε ότι αγαπάτε την Ελλάδα, αλλά ζητάτε να αποκεφαλίσετε του Έλληνε. Και τι Ελλάδα θα απομείνει χωρί του Έλληνε. Μήπω θέλετε να σφάξετε εμά για να κατηγηθεί από εσά ο Φιλέλληνε. Ζητήσαμε τη βοήθειά σα. Ζητήσαμε τον πολιτισμό σα και εσεί μα φέρατε κρεμάδε και ξυφολόγε. Φω ζητήσαμε σκοτάδι μα φέρατε. So the looser effect, although it focuses on the negatives, the negatives that people can become, not the negatives that people are, uh, leads me to a psychological definition. Evil is the exercise of power, and that's the key, it's about power to intentionally harm people psychologically, to hurt people physically, to destroy people mortally or ideas, and to commit crimes against humanity. So how do psychologists go about understanding such transformations of human character? There are three ways. The main way is what's called dispositional. We look at what's inside of the person, the bad apples. This is the foundation of all of social sciences, the foundation of religion, the foundation of law. Uh, Social psychologists like me come along and say, yeah, people are the actors on the stage, but you'll have to be aware of what the situation is. Who are the cast of characters? What's the costume? Is there a stage director? And so we're interested in what are the external factors around the individual, the bad barrel. And social scientists stop there, and they miss the big point that I discovered when I was, became an expert witness for Abu Ghraib. The power is in the system. The system creates the situation that cor corrupts the individuals. And the system is the legal, political, uh, economic, cultural background, and this is where the power is of the bad barrel makers. So you want to change a person, you've got to change the situation. You want to change the situation, you've got to know where the power is in the system. Education. Distract them from learning something which is constructive, pragmatic, efficient, instead of mathematics, physics, foreign languages, chemistry, teach them history of urban warfare, natural food, uh, <laughs> home economy, your sexuality, anything, as long as it takes you away, uh, social life, replace traditionally established institutions and organizations with fake organizations. Take away the initiative from people. Take away the responsibility from naturally established links between individuals, group of individuals and society at large, and replace them with artificially, bureaucratically controlled bodies. Instead of social life and friendship between neighbors, establish social workers institutions. The people who are on payroll of whom? Society? No. Bureaucracy. The main concern of social workers is not your family, not you, not social relations between groups of people. The main concern is to get the paycheck from the government. What will be the result of their social work doesn't really matter. They can develop all kinds of concepts to show them, to show to the government and to the people that they're useful. Power structure. Okay. The natural bodies of administration, which are traditionally either elected by, by people at large or appointed by elected leaders of society, are being actively substituted by artificial bodies. The bodies of people, groups of people, whom nobody elected, never, as a matter of fact, most of the people don't like them at all, and yet they exist. One of such group is media. Who elected them? <laughs> how come, how come they, they, pay, they, they, they have so much power? Almost monopolistic power on your mind. They can rape your mind. But who elected them? How come they are 
They have a nerve to decide what is good and what is bad for, for the elected by you, President and, and his administration. Who the hell are they? They think they know. They don't. The, the level of mediocrity in a big establishment like New York Times, Los Angeles Times, major television network, you don't have to be excellent journalist. You have to be exactly a mediocre journalist. That's easier to survive. There's no competition anymore. You have your good, nice income, $100,000 a year. That's it. Whether you're better or worse doesn't really matter anymore. As soon as you're smiling to the camera and do your job. That's it. No more, no more competition. Power structure slowly uh, is eroded by the bodies and groups of people who do not have neither qualification nor the will of people to keep them in power, and yet they do have power. Και αντί η Ελλάδα να κινηθεί με αυτό το όραμα που σας έλεγα πριν, φοβάμαι ότι στο τέλος του κύκλου, που θα είναι το 2004, θα είναι το 2010, τότε θα δούμε ότι αντί για αυτήν την Ελλάδα, για την οποία λίγο πολύ όλοι μιλούν αργά, θα είναι μια Ελλάδα που την ονομάζω εδώ και καιρό Τουρκομπαρόκ. Θα είναι δηλαδή μια Ελλάδα... Ένα φτωχό ίσως και συρρυκνωμένο βιλαέτη η γερμανικό Λάντερ. Τελικά σας λέω το εξής. Μπορεί στο τέλος αυτού του κύκλου να μην είναι η Ελλάδα που θα παρέμβει στα Βαλκάνια, που θα ενσωματώσει την ενδοχώρα, αλλά μπορεί να είναι η ενδοχώρα που θα ενσωματώσει τα άκρα. Σκεφτείτε το πολύ αυτό. Αλλάζουμε την Ελλάδα. Αλλάζουμε τον τρόπο άσκησης της εξουσίας. Αλλάζουμε οριστικά και αμετάκλητα το κράτος. Πάμε σε μόλις 325 δήμους από 1034 δήμους και κοινότητες και σε 13 περιφέρειες. Δημιουργούμε μια αποκεντρωμένη διοίκηση με ισχυρές ενότητες έτοιμες να υποδεχθούν και νέες αρμοδιότητες που θα τους χορηγηθούν από τα Υπουργεία και ο Καλλικράτης είναι μόνο η αρχή αφού θα ακολουθήσει σειρά Αποκέντρωση αρμοδιοτήτων από το κράτο στην αυτοδιοίκηση. What the idea is to sell it to people as devolving power, like to the states or the regions or groups of states, devolving power, giving power to the people. The real reason is to break up the nation state so that there's no unified response to the edifice of power above the super states uh, that they want.
πεθαίνονται από μέρα σε μέρα. Οι δανειακέ συμβάσει θα μα πνίξουν. Εγώ είμαι κριτικιά και δεν παθαίνω πράγμα. Πράγμα, Κωστή μου, είμαστε αυτόνομο κράτο εμεί. Στην ένωση τη Κρήτη με την Ελλάδα το 1911 υπάρχει όρο που λέει ότι μετά από 100 χρόνια θα γίνει δημοψήφισμα. Το έχω, ψάξει, το έχω ψάξει και δεν έχω βρει ακόμα άκρη. Εάν λοιπόν. Επειδή Θες η Κρήτη. Θα κλείσουμε τα Χριστούγεννα τώρα την Κρήτη. Εάν λοιπόν. Εάν λοιπόν, εάν, λοιπόν, εάν λοιπόν. Ισχύει αυτό. Και υπάρχει τέτοιο όρο. Και επειδή η Κρήτη είναι εντελώ εγκατελελειμμένη. Θα αρχίσει ένα αγώνα και γι' αυτό θα πρέπει να το ξεκαθαρίσουμε μέσα σε πολύ γρήγορο καιρό. Χρόνο. Θα, θα ακούσουμε την Κρήτη. Να διαμαρτύρεται, δηλαδή, να σηκώνει να σε τάσεις. Να κάτι. Ναι. Εσύ σε δημοψήφισμα θα έβαζε την υπογραφή σου. Όχι, δεν θέλω. Α, δεν το θέλω. Όμως, ναι. όμως, εάν... Μην δούμε σημαίες εκεί. Εάν όμως, εάν, αν όμως, οι κυβερνήσεις συνεχίσουν να έχουν την Σωστό, ίδια ναι. τακτική Σωστό. απέναντι στην Κρητή, τότε τα πράγματα, επειδή έχουμε Αρχίσει ένα χρόνο... Αρχίσει η επανάσταση. Ε, δε, επανάσταση όχι, είπαμε δημοψήφισμα. Τα πράγματα είναι πάρα πολύ άσχημα. Εάν σας φύγουμε, σωστό, αν σας φύγουμε, τότε Κοίτα, Νίκο, δεν ξέρω θα φύγει η Κρήτη <laughs> και φύγει και η Βόρεια Ελλάδα, πάει. Έτσι. Έτσι δεν είναι. Ναι, Μπα... τόση, δεν ανοίγω σωστό. όρεξη. Ε, μα... Δεν ανοίγω. Ένα λεπτό. Εγώ είμαι υποχρεωμένος αυτές τις φωνές που υπάρχουν και κυκλοφορούν. Πότε σε δύο χρόνια ουσιαστικά. Ε, ναι, ναι. Ε, πας περιπτώσει δεν είναι. Συγγέται πάρα πολύ ξέρεις. Έτσι. Και βγήκαν και πανώ και... Έτσι. Ωραία! Όλα στο ίδιο πακέτο είναι!
ρωτάει ο ίδιο ο Αμερικανό Ναύαρχο, και τι θα πείτε στην κοινή σα γνώμη, και απαντάει ο Θόδωρο Πάγκαλο. Θα πούμε ότι τη σημαία την πήρε ο αέρα. Είναι τρομακτικό. Αυτό πα σε ειδικό δικαστήριο παραβίαση του συντάγματο και απόπειρα εξαπάτηση του ελληνικού λαού για την εκχώρηση κυριαρχικών δικαιωμάτων. Και που να έχει ζημένο και χίλια συγγνώμη, θα καταργηθεί ο σταυρό από τη σημαία μα. Με ό,τι θέλει ο λαό θα γίνει. Ακούστε να δείτε κάτι. Μα δεν μου απαντάτε όμω τι κάνει. Θα ψηφίσει όταν το καταργήσει ο λαό. Λέτε ό,τι θέλει ο λαό. Κύριε Σιφουνάκη, αν μου επιτρέπετε. Ό,τι θέλει ο λαό, αυτό πώ μεταφράζεται. Θα ψηφίσουμε για το αν θα κατεβάσουμε, θα βγάλουμε το σταυρό μα από τη σημαία. Πετε το Πασόκ το 1981, βασική του. Διακήρυξη. Μια από τι βασικέ κυβερνητικέ του διακήρυξη ήταν ο διαχωρισμό ο πλήρη τη Εκκλησία από το κράτο. Το Κάτι που έχει γίνει στη Ρωσία και στην Ελλάδα. Ενδέχεται να αλλάξει η σημαία μα, κύριε Σιφουνάκη. Ενδέχεται. Εδώ είναι η μόνιμη θέση του Κωνσταντίνου Καραβαλή να ταινίζει τον Όλυμπο και τον Θερμαϊκό Κόλπο. Ενώ τι κόλπο είναι αυτό, ο κύριο Μπουτάρη, ο κύριο Ευάγγελο Βενιζέλο. Ο κύριο Ευάγγελο Βενιζέλο, εκπροσωπώντα μάλιστα την κυβέρνηση, ήταν σαφέ ότι έστειλε ένα μήνυμα προ όλε τι κατευθύνσει. Ο ενωτικό ήταν και ο ίδιο ο κύριο Μπουτάρη. Δεν κατεβαίνει η σημαία. Έτσι. Κρυφτό δεν θα παίξουμε με τη σημαία. Θα την κρύβουμε για να περνάμε στα κρυφά. Εκεί, εμείς δεν ζαλείτε. Εκεί πήγαινε πέρα. Η αστυνομία όλους φροντίζει. Προστατεύουν. Η σημαία είναι το λίγο. Η σημαία είναι το λίγο. Η σημαία είναι το λίγο. Δεν κατεβάζουμε τη σημαία για να... γιατί μπορούσαμε να το παίξουμε και εμεί τώρα στα κρυφά για να πάμε. Όχι, με τη σημαία θα πάμε. Με τη σημαία είναι το λύκο. Τα, ίμια... τα ίδια κάνα και στα έμια ο κύριο Πάγκαλο. Όχι, κύριο. Ναι, ναι. Αδερφέ, άμα θέλουμε να πάμε στον Άγιο Παντελήμο να μπορούμε να πάμε με άλλο τρόπο. Θε να υποστείλουμε τη σημαία τώρα για να περάσουμε. Είναι δυνατόν. Άμα θέλουμε να πάμε, θα πάμε. Δεν θα κάτσουμε εδώ μέχρι αύριο. Τώρα έγινα βασίστα.
Δείτε, δείτε εδώ κύριε Κοκαλάκη για να μας εξηγήσετε μετά τι ακριβώς γίνεται εδώ. Δεν έχω καταλάβει. Η κουκουλουφόρη είναι δικό του στρατός. Όταν χρειαστεί θα πιάσουν και αυτοί ορισμένες θέσεις. Και είναι εκπαιδεμένοι και κάνουν αυτή τη δουλειά. Γι' αυτό είναι εδώ. Και δεν είναι λίγοι. Λίγοι παρουσιάζονται, παρουσιάζουν όσους θέλουν. Είναι περισσότεροι. Υπάρχουν και οι ομάδες, οι εκπαιδευμένες και οι στρατολογημένες στους αλλοδαφούς. Σε κάθε εθνικότητα αλλοδαφών γράφω στο βιβλίο μου, εδώ και δέκα χρόνια. Δεν το διάβασαν οι δημοσιογράφοι και οι πολιτικοί. Το λέω όμως από τις τηλεοράσεις. Δεν τα ακούσαν. Έχουν ομάδες κεντρικούς πυρήνες εκπαιδευμένους. Στρατιωτικά, αστυνομικά και τους πληρώνουν. Αυτούς τους γραταφορεμένους και καλοφορεμένους ντυμένους που βλέπετε αλλοδαπούς να κυκλοφορούν στην Αθήνα είναι τα στηλέχη αυτών των ομάδων. Και όταν χρειαστεί θα τους ξεσηκώσουν αυτούς και θα αρχίσουν να σφάζουν Έλληνες. Ή να λαιλατούν καταστήματα. Το 2008 κύριε το Δεκέμβριο το είχαμε βιώσει αυτό. Το γνωρίσαν οι Αθηναίοι αυτό. Αυτό που κάνανε οι Ολοδαποί που μπήκαν στα καταστήματα, κάψαν ορισμένα, λαϊλατήσαν άλλα, δεν ήταν τυχαία ή τυχαίοι οι Ολοδαποί, ήταν η άσκηση μάχη των οργανωμένων Ολοδαπών. Επομένω, έχουμε πολλέ δυνάμει κατακτητών στη χώρα μα. Ξεκάθαρα πλέον. Και να τι ξέρετε. Έχουμε στη τηλεφωνική γραμμή τον εκπρόσωπο τύπου της πυροσβεστικής, τον, τον κύριο Νίκο Τσόγκα. Α, καλησπέρα σας. Καλησπέρα σας. Μπορείτε καταρχήν να μας πείτε αν στο κτίριο που βλέπουμε να καίγεται στα δύο και χρήση του Λαδά έχουν απεγκλωβιστεί όντως όλοι οι άνθρωποι που ήταν εγκλωβισμένοι. Ε, από τις πρώτες πληροφορίες που είχαμε εκεί δεν έχουμε εγκλωβισμένους άνθρωποι, άτομα στο κτίριο στην χρήση του Λαδά. Τώρα, ποια άλλα, πόσα άλλα κτίρια καίγονται αυτή τη στιγμή στο κέντρο τη Αθήνα. Αυτή τη στιγμή έχουμε περίπου 10 κτίρια, ε, αλλά συνεχώ μα έρχονται πληροφορίε και για άλλα τι οποίε ελέγχουμε και όπου μπορούν κάνουμε, κάνουμε οχήματα. Κινδυνεύει κάποια ανθρώπινη ζωή σε Αν κάποια από αυτέ τι 10 φωτιέ. Όχι κύριε Στραβελάκη, δεν έχουμε αυτή τη στιγμή ε, πληροφορία ότι κινδυνεύει η ανθρώπινη ζωή. Ε, θα ήθελα όμως στο σημείο αυτό να κάνω έκκληση από το κανάλι σας, οι πολίτες να διευκολύνουν την πρόσβαση των οχημάτων στις πυρκαγιές. Έχουμε πολύ μεγάλο πρόβλημα πρόσβαση στις ε, πυρκαγιές ε, και γίνεται πιο ε, δύσκολη η κατάσβεση όταν αργούμε να πάμε. Δεν αυτό... μπορούν να φτάσουν τα οχήματα εξαιτία των διαδηλωτών ή γιατί έχουν στήσει μπλόκα οι Εξαιτία των διαδηλωτών, η αστυνομία κάνει υπεράνθρωπε προσπάθειε να μα βοηθήσει να πλησιάσουμε. Όμω εξαιτία των διαδηλωτών είναι δύσκολη η πρόσβαση.
Αθήνα έχει μετατραπεί σε ένα απέραντο πεδίο μάχη με συμπλοκέ σώμα με σώμα ανάμεσα σε αστυνομικού και διαδηλωτέ. Οδού φιλελίνων και όθονο. Νεαροί πετούν πέτρε, ξύλα και άλλα αντικείμενα στου αστυνομικού, οι οποίοι αρχικά χρησιμοποιούν τα κρυγόνα και χειρομοβίδε κρότου λάμψη για να του αποθήσουν, ενώ στη συνέχεια περνούν στην αντεπίθεση. Επί ώρα κοκκουλοφόροι εκτόξευαν πέτρες εναντίον των ανδρών των ΜΑΤ, ενώ ήσθησαν οδοφράγματα και έβαλαν φωτιά. In 1971, Phil Zimbardo conducted a revolutionary experiment here in the bowels of Stanford University. It rocked the world of psychology. A group of students were divided randomly into prisoners and guards and forced to live in a makeshift jail. The prisoners immediately became submissive. And the guards became cruel. We analyzed the behavior of each of the groups, each of the individuals, and by the end of a week, uh, they were totally different creatures. Dave Escherman was 17 at the time of the experiment. He was to become the ringleader of the guards, showing the cruelest and most sadistic behavior. During the experiment, there was never a time that I felt guilty about what I was doing. Afterwards, on reflection, then certainly, but uh, I think I was so deeply into my character at the time that it never crossed my mind that I was doing anything harmful. Within a week, Phil Zimbardo's prison had become inhumane and the experiment had to be cut short. At one point, prisoner 416 tried to stage his own rebellion. There was one prisoner that decided they would go on a hunger strike and he wasn't going to eat. So we withheld food from the rest of them. Get in that trial, man. We decided that we would throw this hunger striker into the closet and then uh, smack the door as hard as we could, uh, you know, let the other prisoners know that they're being punished because of what this prisoner had done. Thank you, Paul I was surprised at how easy it was to intimidate them and to break down their resolve and to uh, upset their solidarity that they had with each other, we were able to pretty much isolate each one of them so they felt that they could not rely on their fellow prisoners. Would you electrocute a stranger? No way, not me, I'm a good person. He said, why don't we put you in a situation and give you a chance to see what you would do? And so what he did was he tested a thousand ordinary people. It is May 1962. An experiment is being conducted in the Elegant Interaction Laboratory at Yale University. The subjects are 40 males between the ages of 20 and 50 residing in the greater New Haven area. They were obtained by a newspaper advertisement and direct mail solicitation. 
The subjects range in occupation from corporation presidents to good humor men and plumbers, and an educational level from one who had not finished elementary school to subjects who have doctorate and other professional degrees. Now, both of you have been paid, so let me sit right down. So let me say that the checks are yours simply for showing up at the lab. And from this point on, no matter what happens, the money is yours. Uh, I should like to tell both of you a little about the memory project. Psychologists have developed several theories to explain how people learn uh, various types of material. Uh, some of the better known theories are treated in the book over there, the teaching and learning process by Cantor. One theory is that people learn things correctly whenever they get punished for making a mistake. A common application of this theory would be when parents thank a child if he does something wrong. But actually, we know very little about the effect of punishment on learning because almost no truly scientific studies have been made of it in human beings. Uh, for instance, we don't know how much punishment is best for learning. And we don't know how much difference it makes as to who's giving the punishment, whether an adult learns best from an older or a younger person than himself or many things of this sort. So what we're doing project is bringing together a number of adults of different occupations and ages, and we're asking some of them to be teachers and some to be learners. Uh, we want to find out just what effect different people have on each other as teachers and learners, and also what effect uh, punishment will have on learning in this situation. Uh, therefore, I'm going to ask one of you to be the teacher uh, here this afternoon, and the other be the learner. This machine uh, generates electric shocks, and when you press one of the switches all the way down, the learner gets a shock. When you release it, the shock stops, you see, like that. The switch will remain in this middle position after you've released it to show you which switches you've used on the board. Of course, if you were to press uh, any one of them again, the learner would get another shock. All subjects are given identical instructions and a sample shock. Your job as teacher is to give this guy material to learn. Gets it right, reward him. Gets it wrong, you press a button on the shock box. First button is 15 volts. He doesn't even feel it. That's the key. All evil starts with 15 volts. And then the next step is another 15 volts. The problem is at the end of the line is 450 volts. And as you go along, the guy is screaming. I've got a hard condition. I'm out of here. You're a good person. You complain. Sir, who's going to be responsible if something happens to him? Experiment says, don't worry. I will be responsible. Go continue, teacher. And the question is, who would go all the way to 450 volts? I sh you should notice here, when it gets up to 375, it says danger, severe shock. When it gets up to here, there's triple X, the pornography of power. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and estimate the number of volts you receive in the sample shock. Uh, do not open your eyes until I tell you to do so, please. Would you close them now? Okay, you may open your eyes, and using the voltage scale uh, here, would you estimate for me the number of volts you receive, please? You may also use the verbal designation, slight, moderate, strong, so forth, to help you. Say a moderate. A number, please. Would you? About 75. 75. No, actually, it was 45 here. <clears throat> Although it may have seemed stronger because of the uh, electrode paste, which provides a perfect contact. So. All right, let's go on to our instructions. We will begin with this test. Uh, you will read each pair of words in this list once to the learner until you've read through the entire list. Direct your voice toward that microphone as the rooms are partially soundproof. After you've read through the list once, you'll go on to the next page. And here, starting from line A, you'll read the word in large letters along with each of the other words in the line. For example, in the first line you read blue, boy, girl, grass, hat. Now after you've read the four choices, the learner pushes one of the switches on the board in front of him. And the number he has selected will light up in this box, one, two, three, or four. Now, if he gives the correct answer, you say correct and go on to the next line. The correct answer is underlined and is also indicated in the right margin. Yeah. If he were to indicate the wrong answer, you would say wrong. Then tell him the number of volts you're going to give him. Then give him the punishment. Then read the correct word pair once. And then go on to the next line. For example, if he indicated three for blue, you would say wrong. Fifteen volts. You press and release the switch. Read blue girl, and then go on to the next line. I see. I see. Now, each time he gives a wrong answer, you move up one switch on the shock generator. I see. And it's important that you follow this procedure exactly. The victim was an accomplice of the experimenter.
The drawing was rigged so that the naive subject was always the teacher and the accomplice always became the learner. Well, of a hundred people placed in this situation, how many do you think would just go right on to the end? You're asking me how many people? Out of a hundred, right. Well, personally, I think yeah, if you get one or two, you'd be lucky. Well, I'm not sure lucky is, is the right <laughs> word. Forty psychiatrists at a leading medical school were also asked to predict the performance of 100 hypothetical subjects. They predicted that only a little more than one-tenth of one percent of the subjects would administer the highest shock on the board. Yet actually, 50 percent of the subjects obeyed the experimenter's commands fully in the experiment depicted in this film. So Milgram asked 40 psychiatrists, how many, what percent of American citizens would go to the end? They said only 1%, because that's sadistic behavior, and we know, psychiatry knows, only 1% of Americans are sadistic. Okay. Here's the data. They could not be more wrong. Two-thirds go all the way to 450 volts. This was just one study. Milgram did more than 16 studies. 165 volts. Time. Continue, please. Go on. There's a lot of them here, you know, you have a heart condition there. You want me to go? Just continue, please. Sh sharp. Axe, needle, stick, blade. Pass, please. Wrong. Nice. I'm up to 100 heavy holes. Please continue, teacher. Needle, you're going to get a shot. 180 volts. I'm not going to kill that man today. You hear him hollering? He's he's they said before, the shocks may be painful, but yeah, they're not he's dangerous. They're hollering. He can't stand it. What if something happens to him? The experiment requires that you continue teaching. Yeah, but uh, I'm not going to get that man sick of that. I mean, he's hollering there. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> he's Whether the learner likes it or not, we must go on until well, he's learned I mean, all the uh, word I I'd refuse to take the responsibility of getting hurt in there. I'm not, I mean, he's under hollering. It's absolutely essential that you continue, teacher. There's too many left here, and I mean, geez, he, go, he gets wrong here. There's too many of them left. I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one, slow. Wrong. Answer is neck. 300 volts. <laughs> Get me out of here. You can't hold me here. Get me out. Get me out of here. Continue. The next word is green, please. Green. Grass, hat, ink, apple. I can't go on. He won't answer. If the learner doesn't answer in a reasonable time, about four or five seconds, consider the answer wrong and follow the same procedure as you have been doing for wrong answers. Say wrong, tell them the number of volts, give them the punishment, read them the correct answer. Oh, man. Continue, please. Something's happened to that man in there. National gold, dollar, necklace, moon, paint. Something's happened to that man in there. You better check in on him, sir. He won't answer me or nothing. Please uh, continue. Go on, please. You accept all the responsibility? The responsibility is mine, correct. Please go on. Brave, woman, soldier, dog, horse. Answer is woman, 450 volts. That's it. Now continue using the last switch on the board, please. The 450 switch for each wrong answer. Continue, please. I'm not getting no answer. Please continue. The next word is white. Don't you think you should look in on him, please? Not once we've started the experiment. But what if something's happened to a man had an attack or something there? The experiment requires that we continue. Go on, please. Don't, uh, don't the man's health mean anything? Whether the learner likes it or not, we but must... But he might be dead in there. I mean, some people can't take the shock, sir. Please I mean, continue. I don't tend to be rude, but I mean, I think you should look in on him. Whether I mean, the... all you gotta do is look at the door. I don't get no answer, no noise. Something I think has happened to the gentleman in there, sir. We must continue. Go on, please. You're going to keep giving what, 450 volts every shot now? That's correct. Continue. 
The next word is white. White. 450 volts. Next one is short. Sentence, movie, skirt, time. All right, excuse me, teacher. We'll have to discontinue the experiment. I'd like to uh, ask you a few questions, if I may. How do you feel, though? I feel all right, but I don't like what's happened. That I fall in there, he's been howling, and we had to keep giving him shocks. I didn't like that one bit. I mean, he's, he wanted to get out, and he just kept going, kept throwing 450 volts. I didn't like that. He wouldn't even look at him, that gentleman. Well, who was actually pushing the switch? I was. But he kept insisting. I told him no, but he said, he got to keep going. I told him it's time we stopped when we got up to uh, 195, 210 volts. But why didn't you just stop? He wouldn't let me. I wanted to stop. Many people not knowing much about the experiment claim that subjects who go to the end of the board are sadistic. Nothing could be more foolish as an overall characterization of these persons. The context of their action must always be considered. The individual upon entering the laboratory becomes integrated into a situation that carries its own momentum. The results, as I observe them in the laboratory, are disturbing. They raise the possibility that human nature cannot be counted on to insulate men from brutality and inhumane treatment at the direction of malevolent authority. A substantial proportion of people do what they are told to do, irrespective of the content of the act and without limitations of conscience, so long as they perceive that the command comes from a legitimate authority. If in this study, an anonymous experimenter could successfully command adults to subdue a 50-year-old man and force on him painful electric shocks against his protests, one can only wonder what government, with its vastly greater authority and prestige, can command of its subjects. So Milgram is quantifying evil as to the willingness of people to blindly obey authority to go all the way to 40 50 volts. And it's like a dial on human nature, a dial in the sense that you can make almost everybody totally obedient down to the majority, down to none. Does it make a difference if they're anonymous in how they treat their victims? We know in some cultures they go to war, they don't change appearance. In other cultures, they paint themselves like Lord of the Flies. In some, they wear masks. In many, they wear soldiers are anonymous in uniform. So with this psycho anthropologist, John Watson, found 23 cultures that had two bits of data. Do they change their appearance? 15. Uh, do they kill, torture, and mutilate? 13. If they don't change their appearance, only one of eight kills, torture, and mutilate. The key is in the red zone. If they change their appearance, 12 of 13, that's 90%, kill, torture, mutilate. And that's the power of anonymity. So what are the seven social processes that grease the slippery slope of evil? Mindlessly taking the first small step. Dehumanization of others. Deindividuation of self. Diffusion of personal responsibility. Blind obedience of authority. Uncritical conformity to group norms. Passive tolerance of evil through inaction or indifference. And it happens when you're in a new or unfamiliar situation. Your habitual response patterns don't work. Your personality and morality are disengaged. So social psychological research reveals how ordinary good people can be transformed without the drugs. You don't need it. You just need the social psychological processes. Real world parallels. Compare this with this. James Schlesinger, and I'm going to have to end with this, says, psychologists have attempted to understand how and why individuals and groups who usually act humanely can sometimes act otherwise in certain circumstances. That's the looser effect. And he goes on to say, the landmark Stanford study provides a cautionary tale for all military operations. If you give people power without oversight, it's a prescription for abuse. They knew that and let that happen. Law enforcement, law and order uh, organization and structure is being eroded. For the last 20, 25 years, you, you, if, if you see old movies and new movies, you can see that in new movies, a policeman, an officer of the United States Army looks dumb, angry, psychotic, paranoid. A criminal looks nice, kind of, well, he smokes hash and, and shoots the uh, whatever drug, but basically he's a nice human being. He's creative. And he's unproductive only because society oppresses him. Whereby a general of Pentagon is always, by definition, a dumb, a war maniac. A policeman is a pig, rude policeman. He abuses his power. You know? A generality, generalization like that. The hatred, the mistrust to the people who are supposed to protect you and enforce law and order. Moral relativity, a slow substitution of basic moral principles.
οι δημοσκοπήσεις είναι κατευθυνόμενες. Ναι, αλλά το έγραψα, πριν από, το έγραψα πριν από 8-9 χρόνια και τελευταία όταν ζορίστηκαν με τις δημοσκοπήσεις στις τελευταίες εκλογές ορισμένοι πολιτικοί αναγκάστηκαν να πούν αυτό που λέω <coughs> ότι δεν είναι γνήσιες. Οι δημοσκοπήσεις, κύριε Γράφο, στο βιβλίο μου ο Βωμός της Ελπίδος το νέο όπλο των κοσμοκρατόρων είναι Ταγκάλοπ. Οι άνθρωποι που χειρίζονται τα γκάλοπ έχουν σπουδάσει στα Ινστιτούτα τα Βιστόκ. Τα Ινστιτούτα τα Βιστόκ υπάρχουν 30 στην Αμερική και τώρα τελευταία έκαναν και δυο τρία στην Αγγλία και πουθενά αλλού στον κόσμο. Διδάσκουν πώς θα μπορέσεις να μεταβάλεις την κοινή γνώμη ενός λαού. Επομένως, όταν θέλουν να μεταβάλουν τη γνώμη ενός λαού, θα τη μεταβάλουν μέσω των δημοσκοπήσεων. The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality But little by little, <laughs> he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. Here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> Now we'll see if we can use... See if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. There it is. Notice they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. The Ash experiment is one of psychology's oldest and most popular pieces of research. A volunteer is told that he's taking part in a visual perception test. What he doesn't know is that the other participants are actors and he's the only person taking part in the real test, which is actually about group conformity. Please begin. The experiment you will be taking part in today involves the perception of line length. Your task will be simply to look at the line here on the left and indicate which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. So, for example, if you... The actors have been told to match the wrong lines. The volunteer will be monitored to see if he gives the correct answer or if he goes along with the opinion of the group and gives the wrong answer. In the first test, the correct answer is to... Uh, one. 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 Two. One. 
Once again, the correct answer is two. Three. 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 The ASH experiment has been repeated many times, and the results have been uh, supported again and again. We will conform to the group. Again, we're very social creatures. We're very much aware of what the people around us think. Uh, we want to be liked. We don't want to be seen to rock the boat, so we will go along with the group. Even if we don't believe what people are saying, we'll still go along. One. 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 Group dynamics is one of the most powerful forces in human psychology. Uh, one. In case of religion, destroy it, ridicule it, replace it with various sects, cults, which bring people's attention, faith, whether it is naive, primitive, doesn't really matter. As long as the basically accepted religious dogma is being slowly eroded and taken away from the supreme purpose of religion, to keep people in touch with, with the supreme being, that serves the purpose. Therefore, replace it, accepted, respected religious organizations with fake organizations. Distract people's attention from the real faith and attract them to various different faiths.
labor relations. At this stage, within 15 to 20 years, we destroy the traditionally established links of bargaining between employer and employee. The classical Marxist-Leninist uh, theory of natural exchange of goods. Uh, a person A has five sacks of grain and person B has five pairs of shoes. And the natural exchange without money is when they bargain between each other. And only with the introduction of the third force C, uh, an entirely third foreign stranger who says, no, don't give him five sacks of grain, give it to me, and you give me your five pairs of shoes, and I will distribute it accordingly, so that the economy will go. This is the death of natural exchange, the death of natural bargaining. Well, trade unions were established 100 years ago. The objective was to improve working conditions and to protect the rights of workers from those employers who were abusing their, their right because they had more money. Objectively, at that time, initially, the trade union movement did work. What we see now is that the bargaining pro process is no longer resulting into, in the compromise, which is leading objectively to betterment of working conditions and increase of salary. What we see is that after each prolonged strike, the workers lose. Even if they have 10% increase of their salaries, they cannot catch up due to inflation and due to missed time. More than that, millions of people suffer from that strike because the economy now is interdependent. It's intertwined like one body. If previously uh, steel workers, say 100 years ago, could strike and nobody would suffer. Now it's impossible anymore. If a garbage collector strikes today, the rest of the multi-million city is stinking. I mean, the, the, there's no more service. Uh, in Quebec, for example, we had the electricians who were on strike. In the middle of winter, you can freeze your bottom, and they still were on strike. Did they catch up with the salary? No, they lost. Who benefited? The leaders of trade union. What is the motivation for strike? Improving, improving of wor uh, a worker's condition? No, obviously it's not. Then what is it? Ideology. To prove to these capitalists. And the obedient horde of workers, like sheep, follow these people. And they cannot disobey. Why? Because if they do, you know what happens to them. Okay, law and order now also is uh, pushed into the area where previously people settled their differences uh, peacefully and legitimately. Uh, 
Now, we are getting with this uh, uh, court cases in the, in the smallest irrelevant cases. We cannot solve our problems anymore. The society at large becomes more and more antagonistic between individuals, between groups of individuals and the society at large. The, the real world war is a psychic one. The real war is on consciousness. And too many people are forgetting this in this conspiratorial movement, so to speak, or in alternative history. And I will not ever make that mistake. I'd like to talk about some things that bring us together. Things that point out our similarities instead of our differences. Because that's all you ever hear about in this country, is our differences. That's all the media and the politicians are ever talking about, the things that separate us, things that make us different from one another. That's the way the ruling class operates in any society. They try to divide the rest of the people. They keep the lower and the middle classes fighting with each other so that they, the rich, can run off with all the fucking money. Fairly simple thing happens to work. You know anything different, that's what they're going to talk about. Race, religion, ethnic and national background, jobs, income, education, social status, sexuality, anything you can do, keep us fighting with each other so that they can keep going to the bank. You know how I describe the economic and social classes in this country? The upper class keeps all of the money, pays none of the taxes. The middle class pays all of the taxes, does all of the work. The poor are there just to scare the shit out of the middle class. Ma ήταν εκείνο το μερμήγκι που μου μπήκε. Ναι, αλλά στο ξεχάσουμε. Ναι, να το σοδάμε. Σωστά! Ήταν μόνο ένα μερμήγκι. Αφεντικό μικρούλι. Μικρούλι. Λοιπόν, φανταστείτε ότι ο σφόρος είναι ένα μικρούλι μυρμηγκάκι. Πόνασες. Όχι. Μήπως αυτό το λάει. Με δουλεύεις. Αν αφήσεις ένα μυρμήγκι να σε αμφισβητήσει μετά όλα ίσως κάνουν το ίδιο. Σε κάθε μια ακρίδα αναλογούν εκατό μυρμηγκάκια. Κι αν κάποτε το σκεφτούν αυτό θα έρθει η καταστροφή μας. Δεν πρόκειται για την τροφή. Πρέπει όμως να διατηρείτε η τάξη. Γι' αυτό λοιπόν θα γυρίσουμε. This is how it's done. This is how a few can actually control the mass. Because you can't do it with tanks in the streets and soldiers at the door. There's too many people. It's like trying to physically herd sheep together. You can't do it. You'd need a, you'd need a, a man, maybe more than one, for every sheep to do it physically. You have to do it through the mind. Either through fear or through conditioning people to think the way you want them to think. Ξέρουν το τέλος και μου τη δίνει. Είσαι ένα σκουπίδι. Όχι, λάθος. Χειρότερος από σκουπίδι. Είσαι μυρμήγκι. Αυτό να γίνει μάθημα σε όλους σας. Η ιδέας είναι πολύ επικίνδυνο πράγμα. Είστε ασήμαντοι, χαμένοι βρομοσκαφιάδες. Που υπάρχετε για να υπηρετείτε εμάς. Κάνες λάθος, χωπλά. Τα μυρμήκια δεν γεννήθηκαν για να υπηρετούν ακρίδες. Έχω δει μυρμήκια να μεγαλουργούν. Και χρόνο με το χρόνο καταφέρνουν να μαζεύουν τροφή για τα ίδια και για σας. Άρα ποιο είναι το ασθενέστερο είδος. Δεν είμαστε υπηρέτες των ακρίδων. Εσείς χρειάζεστε εμάς. Είμαστε πολύ πιο δυνατοί από σας. Και το ξέρεις, νομίζω. Λοιπόν, 
Λοιπόν, τριγκυπέσα. Χόπλα, συγγνώμη που διακόπτω, αλλά. Μυρμήγια, κάντε πίσω! Έλληνε, παπαχή! Ω, ήταν πολύ κακή ιδέα. Βλέπει, Χόπλα, η φύση έχει τη δική τη τάξη. Τα μυρμήγια μαζεύουν την τροφή, την κρατάνε την τροφή και η ακρίδα. Φεύγει. Divide and conquer is the motto. And as long as people continue to see themselves as separate from everything else, they lend themselves to being completely enslaved. The men behind the curtain know this, and they also know that if people ever realize the truth of their relationship to nature, and the truth of their personal power, the entire manufactured zeitgeist they prey upon will collapse like a house of cards. Crisis is when society cannot function any more productively. It collapses, obviously. That's the word for crisis. So therefore, the population at large is looking for a savior. The religious groups are expecting a messiah to come. The workers say, we have family to feed. Let's have a strong government, maybe socialist government, centralized, when, when somebody put put the employers on their place and, and let us work. We are sick and tired of going to strike and, and missing overtime and all that stuff. We need some strong man, strong government, a leader, a savior is needed. Population is sick and tired already. And here we are, we have a savior. Either a foreign nation comes in or the local group, a savior comes and says, I will lead you. So we have two alternatives here. Civil war and invasion. Okay? See how it goes? The next stage is normalization. At that stage, the self-appointed rulers of the society don't need any revolution anymore. They don't need any radicalism anymore. So, this is the reverse from destabilization. Basically, it is stabilizing the country by force. The new rulers need stability to exploit the nation, to exploit the country, to take advantages of the victory. Okay? So, no more revolutionaries, please. And that's exactly what happens in a number of countries. Another misconception is that a nation's constitution gives us our rights. A constitution does nothing more than list the rights that we already have. We are born with inalienable rights, endowed to us by our Creator. They are not given to us and they cannot be given away. The most a person can do with a right is choose whether to exercise it or not. Welcome to our ranks, number 1313. I'll take this case to the Supreme Court. The state is the Supreme Court. Our decision is as follows. No more private property. No more you. Where the farm food put a stop to this? Farmers don't vote anymore. What will I do for seed next year? You won't have to worry about next year. The state will do your planning from now on. We must fight to regain our freedom, or everything is lost. Everything! Everything is fine. 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 When anybody, when anybody preaches disunity, tries to pit one of us against the other through class warfare, race hatred, or religious intolerance, you know that person seeks to rob us of our freedom and destroy our very lives. Do you understand what I'm talking about? What is our common bond truly? 
Freedom. Freedom. Without freedom, you can't be a Christian no matter what denomination you belong to. You can't be a Buddhist. You can't own a donut shop. You can't drive from here to Oregon. It's about freedom. freedom. Only freedom. Make no mistake about it, they are our mortal enemies. They want to see us wiped off the face of the earth. Do not allow them to take political force. Do not elect them to the seats of power, whether it is municipality level, state level, or federal level. It has to be beaten in the heads of voters that a person like that in the seats of power is an enemy. Do not be afraid of this word. It is an enemy. If he is not an enemy here, he will be here. Later on he will be shot, of course. <laughs> but at this point he is an enemy. You simply have to have faith and prevent subversion. In other words, not to be a victim of subversion. Don't try to be a person who in Zudo is trying to smash your enemy and being caught by your hand. Don't strike like that. Strike with the power of your spirit and moral superiority. If you don't have that power, it's high time to develop it. And that's the only answer. that can explain the hostile imagination of some of us that makes us perpetrators of evil can inspire the heroic imagination of others. It's the same situation and you're on one side or the other. Most people are guilty of the evil of an action because your mother says don't get involved, uh, mind your own business. And you have to say, Mama, humanity, humanity is my business. business. Humanity is my business. She's self-labeling. I am a hero in waiting and teach them skills. To be a hero you have to learn to be a deviant. You should always go against the conforming of the group. Heroes are ordinary people whose social action is extraordinary, who act. The key to heroes is two things. You have to act when other people are passive. B, you have to act sociocentrically, not egocentrically. I know we're all afraid. But my father told me, someday, someone's going to have to take a stand. Someday, someone's going to have to say enough. Trust your senses. This is going to be that day. 